Retail is addicted to visual trading. Be it for general lack of abstract mathematical skills or the seemingly easier appeal of colorful patterns, trading indicators have almost systematically become the go-to method for designing a strategy. The resulting effect of this intellectual fallback is almost always the same. Slapping the latest most popular indicator on a chart without really understanding what it describes and then proceed to torture its parameters to death in order to make your backtest look great, or worse, cursorily eyeball a few weeks worth of chart data in a lousy attempt to get a feel for for it. You all know how that turns out in the end. We've all been there. But it doesn't mean that you have to remain stuck in this dead end. So in this video, we're going to use a purely quantitative approach to trading indicators, to understand what they really are, what they describe, and how to properly leverage them to your advantage without making a mess out of your trading strategy building. Let's go. Nature is simplex, meaning that its mechanics are not obvious, but they are not unnecessarily convoluted either. Complexity does not mean complication, and the same goes for modeling price changes in trading. These are quite evidently not obvious to describe, but past the non-compressible complexity of volatility and noise, price motion dynamics are pretty bare-bones and straightforward. And this is with that state of mind that I want you to engage this course. You see, the overwhelming amount of trading indicators available for free online, in forums, or on trading platforms is extremely counterproductive. Why? Because they lead most novices to believe that each indicator must be doing something very different, specific, and unique. And this creates a two-sided problem. The first side is that it leads you to acquire a myopic vision of strategy building, literally having you embark on an aimless quest for the so-called best indicator and the elusive best set of parameters that will somehow solve the market, all of which unsurprisingly results in more curve fitting and more dumpster fire trading results. The second side of that problem is its corollary. Because this myopic vision also and most importantly distracts you from focusing on the underlying mathematical reality that you're trying to capture when trading indicators are merely tools to achieve that goal. They do not solve the market. Pertinent use of them in confluence with mathematical understanding of price motion dynamics does, however. So with that reality check now done, we can reassert the nature of trading indicators in order to pinpoint their true value. Only from that point will we know how to use them properly. So let's be very clear once again. There is nothing magical about any particular indicator. Only the focus on a highly significant data set and or capturing the correct price motion dynamics can produce an edge. Trading indicators by themselves do not create edges. They merely dictate how efficiently you process the signal and avoid the noise of that given mathematical phenomenon, which itself generates the edge. So the next time you hear someone talk up their holy grail indicator for a quick cash grab, or you are being asked to focus on the red herring of finding the supposedly specific indicator that will prop all your trading strategy to the next level, you will know what to do. The reality is that you can build the same trading strategy using different or even seemingly opposite trading indicators. So is that even possible? Well, it's actually very simple. All trading indicators can only describe two price motions. That's it, not one more. They either describe exhaustion or continuation of price movements. Said differently, they either capture a parametrically defined price level from which the price is expected to reverse or where momentum is expected to pick up. No matter how you slice them, all trading indicators are nothing but reversible two-trick ponies. To illustrate that reversibility feature, let's take three popular yet seemingly unrelated trading indicators and see what use can be made of them. Let's start with the RSI. The most common use for the RSI is to determine oversold and overbought situations. As in, if the RSI closes, say, below 20, for example, then we should expect the price to swing back up. That's the basic narrative. But all markets are not built the same, and some markets actually behave differently. Commodity markets in particular are extremely subject to momentum, and a low RSI threshold might actually pick up the acceleration of a price drop rather than its exhaustion. So in this instance, the RSI can definitely be interpreted as a momentum indicator with more relevance than its common use as a reversion indicator. As you can see, the pertinent use depends more on the market than the tool itself. And just as I described it earlier, being oblivious to how a market behaves could make you miss the proper indicator used entirely by focusing on what is expected of you by the general user manual of that indicator, if you will, which in this case would be unnecessarily reductive. Now let's double down and look at a totally unrelated indicator, the parabolic SAR. Quite clearly, this envelope can be used both as support and resistance levels indicating reversion, as well as a breakout indicator signaling momentum. Yet again, it is totally reversible. 
and no matter how you tweak it, these are the only two uses that you will be able to extract from this indicator. And lastly, let's use a plain vanilla moving average. How is that even reversible? It's only a line, right? Well, let's look at the obvious use first. It clearly can be used as a support or resistance to help with mean reverting trades, such as for the purpose of trading stocks. That's actually the most popular use. But many will also use it as a market regime indicator. For example, if the price breaks below the 200 day moving average, then we can expect that the market is becoming bearish and the price will continue to drop and vice versa. So here you go, reversibility once again. As I said, what you're dealing with are two trick ponies every single time and nothing better or worse. Where it gets interesting though is that logical reasoning is often not enough to convince people. Somehow, many will cling onto that baseless blanket idea that there are still indicators that are somehow better than others, regardless of the absence of any proof of concept to back it up. So this is where empirical proof is required. And here it is, an equity curve depiction of the exact same mid reversion systems on the S&P 500 index. What the rules are is irrelevant to this exercise. What matters for the purpose of this demonstration is that the only difference between them is the indicator used to capture mean reversion. Model A uses the RSI, Model B uses the MACD, and Model C uses the stochastic indicator. All the rules are identical. Can you tell a radical difference in equity curves? Well, that's my point. They are all profitable regardless. As long as you know what you're trying to capture from a mathematical perspective, the indicator used to capture it is largely irrelevant. It is nothing but a fashion statement at this point. But here is another important takeaway. Understanding the reversibility and the fungible characteristics of trading indicators immediately allows you to get rid of another bad bias in designing your trading system. Ask yourself, how many times have you tried to add one more indicator in an attempt to improve the results of your backtest? I know you have. We've all done the same. Because they do not understand the nature of indicators, most traders keep this counterproductive belief that trading accuracy and performance result from complexity in system design when nothing could be further from the truth. So they keep stacking indicators on top of one another, indicators that do slight variations of the exact same thing and are merely separated by their parametric dialing, but certainly not by their inherent logic. All that they manage to accomplish in the end with that redundant process is to limit the statistical significance of their test by tightening the constraints too much which decreases their trade sample size and they also increase the number of parametric degrees of freedom which in turn weakens the system by making it more prone to curve fitting. Redundancy is a lose-lose proposition and you must make yourself immune to it moving forward for the sake of the robustness of your strategy design. So no more trying to cram too many cooks in the kitchen. Now let's assume that you know what price motion you intend to describe. You modeled it mathematically and you settled for a specific indicator. Let's dig deeper and examine how to properly deal with indicator parameters. First and foremost, I must reiterate that a proper system design should not require any kind of brute force optimization for the system to work. If it does, then you are setting yourself up for trouble. For more information on the subject, an extensive course reviewing that crucial feature was produced in series 2 and I'm linking it at the top right of your screen. Watch it if you are serious about learning how to trade. This course is one of the foundational pillars of your curriculum. But back to topic. So let's assume that you have a properly designed system on hand and that the footprint of your system's parametric density reflects it. What leeway do you have in playing with your indicator? Well, obviously, it is done by dialing your parameters in and out. You didn't need me to tell you that. However, these parametric inputs will almost always take the form of either a lookback period or a signal triggering threshold, or both. For example, an RSI 1025 would mean that the calculation is made over the past 10 bars, that's the look back, and triggers a signal at the 25 and 75 threshold. Nothing new here. What's absolutely primordial though, is to recognize that dialing your parameters should yield a predictable change in your system's risk return profile. If changing your parameters yields a scattered plot of unpredictable algorithmic behavior, then your system is most likely capturing nothing but a statistical artifact because it is not sufficiently based on math. To give you a back of the envelope example, let's imagine a system with a positive expectancy that solely relies on the RSI. In principle, everything else being equal, what you should expect is for your return and risk to rise sharply and your return to risk ratio to drop as you lower the look back and tighten the thresholds and vice versa. In case it would not behave consistently along that scale, then there would be grounds to worry and rethink your entire system design. In any case, you must avoid the pitfall of believing that there is such a thing as a leading price indicator, which is yet another one of these count claims pushed on social media. There is no such thing as it. All price indicators lag by their very definition and algebraic computation, without exception. 
If you're looking for the holy grail, then let me save you the headaches and give you the name of the only free lunch in trading. That's called decorrelation. Achieving decorrelation at the system level is one way to accomplish the task, and this is done by using parametric dialing. Your endeavor at this point will be to design variations of the same system in order to make them produce decorrelated performance and smoothen your equity curve. If you want to know more about that very issue, I purposely made a course on that topic already. Top right. So now we clarified the nature and proper use of indicators, it is time to make it all come together in a single process. First, here is the typical retail process that includes the use of indicators. That's the one you should avoid. It starts with looking at the chart, then slapping an indicator, then eyeballing a few setups, then making up a few rules on the spot, optimizing the parameters into oblivion, and coming up with a single system. As you know now, this is obviously wrong. The correct professional way is the following. You start with math in order to understand the price motion dynamics of your underlying asset. Then you write the rules that synthesize, streamline and capture those math properties. Then you pick an indicator that is the most flexible and easiest to work with to process that signal. Then you backtest your system using a few average parametric combinations. Then you build the entire parametric density. Then you clone a few different system variations that yield various and complementary risk reward profiles. Then you combine them using balance weightings. And finally, you have achieved your goal of a decorrelated algorithmic portfolio. That process, by the way, solves by itself the never-ending conundrum that comes along with trying to pick the best indicator or parametric combination. The boundless search of that elusive optimal compromise between reactivity and reliability of trading signals is simply not attainable if you remain entrapped in the retail misconception of how indicators should be used. Building portfolios of decorrelated systems solves this and they can only be built reliably by snapping out of that myopic view that focuses on indicators alone. I will conclude by saying that if the mathematical architecture of your algorithm is sound, then just about all use cases that you would try to tune your systems for should be solved by merely dialing your parameters. Whether you're looking for a steady and conservative money maker, or an aggressive solution that will only take selective advantage of very specific market configurations, you should not need to add a slew of indicators or abuse optimization to get there. It should all be visible and self-explanatory by staring at your parametric density, ready to be cherry-picked for inclusion in your portfolio. If that is not the case, meaning that your risk-reward profiles are all over the place, then you should go back to step one, right at the theoretical drawing board. Now, if there is one takeaway that you should get from this course, it is the following. Flawed system designs cannot be redeemed with indicators, and no amount of optimization will salvage them. It is always better to reset your work rather than to abuse your tools in the hope to fool the market with statistical stunts. The only thing that you will be able to fool in the end is yourself, but certainly not your true mathematical expectancy. You just can't deceive market math with ego and clever drawings, so stop trying. I'll talk to you in the next video.